Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome again to our celebration for one of America's greatest heroes, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And I have to tell you that after last year's celebration, we immediately began the task of trying to determine what would be the next great topic, the next great speaker to be able to come to Seattle and keep the enthusiasm and inspire all of us to celebrate Dr. King's legacy. With midterm elections then looming, and with the presidential elections just down the road and candidates starting to scamper around right now to declare the candidacy, what better topic than to deal with voting rights? Now, if you were here last year, you recall Diane Nash, one of the great civil rights leaders, she had a chance to present. And one of the things that she raised was voting rights. She was a critical figure in the voting rights issue in Selma. So what better entity, what better organization, and what better group of gladiators to address this issue than NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Now, I have to begin, however, with an apology. We had secured and thought we would have the opportunity here from Ms. Sherilyn Eiffel, the president of the NAAC Legal Defense Fund. But due to unfortunate, challenging circumstances, she was not able to be here with us today. However, however is big, we have the second in command of the Legal Defense Fund, and trust me, you will not be disappointed by any means whatsoever. And she will be here and present to you and join the many outstanding speakers that we've historically had, including Andrew Young, Julian Bond, Diane Nash, and a host of others that were deeply involved in the civil rights movement. And she will share her thoughts with you today. Now, I want you to know we're fortunate to have this quality and caliber of speakers because we have this fine support of many of you here today. And without this type of support, this program wouldn't be able to go forward. Now, I know it'd be quite easy for me to say, all right, just look at the reader board and that's all you need to do in terms of identifying who the sponsors are. But I think it's very important that we actually identify the sponsors so that you know who the folks are, the firms, the entities and companies and individuals who are making what we do every single year today happen. And I hope at the end of this reading that all of you decide that you want to be one of those called and recognized next year. So with that, I'm going to read to you the name of the individuals and groups to help make happen what's going on today. Buckley and Associates, and if you'd hold your applause until we get finished, we'll have one large round of applause. Buckley and Associates, Davis Wright Tremaine, Hillis Clark Martin and Peterson, k l Gates, King County Superior Court Judges, Lane Powell, Microsoft, Patterson, Buchanan, Phobes and Leitch, Perkins Cooey, Schwabe, Williamson and Wyatt, Starbucks Coffee Company, Aoki Law, the appellate section of Carney, Badley, Spellman, Karen Cross and Hempelman, Dorsey and Whitney, Foster Pepper, McDonald Hogan Bayless, McNall, Ebel, Nara and Helgren, Riddell Williams, Skellinger Bender, Stoll Reeves, Stokes Lawrence, Betts Patterson and Mines, Christian O'Connor, Johnson Kinnis, Fosberg Umloff, Riddell, excuse me, Helsel Fetterman, Lynn, Shizzle, and DeMarco, Miller Nash, Graham and Dunn, Bennett Bigelow and Leadham, FTI Consulting, Garvey Schubert, Keller Roback, Lauren Miller Bar Association, Phil Ginsburg, Hackett, Beecher and Hart, Vandenberg, Johnson and Gandera, Washington Women Lawyers Foundation, Washington Women Lawyers, King County Chapter. A round of applause for all the sponsors that we have today. A special thanks also to Dean Kelly Tessie. I saw her in the audience. I won't, I don't see her right now. But I want to recognize her. Go ahead. But I want to recognize Dean Tessie, University of Washington Law School, for their sponsorship this year and for the tremendous amount of support that they provided. So please do me a favor and please do our community a favor. And that's when you see any of these firms or representatives who have helped sponsor this program, please tell them thank you. Please send a letter of thanks. And please know that we deeply appreciate your efforts in helping make this a success. We have a very tight program, so that's the reason I've tried to pick up the pace this morning in the opening comments to you. And at this time, I'd like to introduce to you our co-chair, Karen Murray, 
And a great big round of applause for Karen because she works so hard every single moment to make this a successful program. Good afternoon. My name, once again, is Karen Murray, and I have the honor of co-chairing this special event with the Honorable Richard A. Jones. Although we have the honor of standing before you every year and thoughts are more visible, we continue to realize that this wonderful program could not happen without the help of many who work behind the scenes. I would ask at this time that the MLK Luncheon Committee members please stand and be recognized by this great crowd of almost 700. <laughs> because of time restraints, I feel really bad that I am unable to call out individually your names. But I will say this to all of you. Without them doing what they do throughout the year, we would not have the caliber of program that we offer. So if you would just please, one more time, give them an applause, and please look at their names in the program. Of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that without KCBA and the individuals that do a lot of the grunt work, again, this program would not be. So I would like to acknowledge by name KCBA Executive Director Andrew Prazu, Denise Medlock, and of course, all of the KCBA staff. Thank you, thank you, thank you. As we celebrate King's legacy this afternoon, I offer this up in my own words, how I believe he would want us to celebrate his legacy this afternoon. I can't help but think that he would say to us, like only a Baptist preacher could, the following. Sisters and brothers, if you must celebrate me, please don't forget those who came before me those who worked with me, those who stood with me during unpredictable times, and those who came behind me to continue to fight for equality and justice for all. Please remember, the Civil Rights Movement was a collaboration of many ideas, of different individuals, and of different ages. But please remember, it was the belief in the message that freedom from unjust laws had to be challenged to allow all to reach their full potential. For this to happen, it took knowledge of what went on before and a plan that would stand the test of hatred. This took many ordinary people doing extraordinary things and a willingness to face death itself. So today, when you celebrate my legacy, do so in the honor of all those who were part of the movement, then in the new movement now. This way, you have indeed honored all that I stood for. I truly believe if King were here today, this is what he would have said. So without further ado, Let's begin King's celebration. Dr. King loved music. And whether he was in the pulpit of a church, leading a nonviolent protest with his fellow marchers, or sitting in someone's living room or hotel room, he could always be found humming a tune or asking someone to play or sing his favorite song. 
He often was overheard telling those closest to him how music soothed his soul and gave him the courage to forge onward when fear immobilized him. So what better way to begin this afternoon's program than to have the Graham Hill Choir, led by the director, Sherry Adams, to sing for us. The choir will first sing the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice, then followed by two musical selections, Free at Last, and If You Miss Me at the Back of the Bus. Please find the lyrics of the Black Anthem in your program, and at the direction of Miss Adams, please stand.
Miss Adams, thank you. Your choir has outshined themselves. Thank you. Now, believe me, if you guys didn't feel that, and if you didn't clap, there's something wrong with you. Thank you so much, Miss Adams, in the Graham Hill Choir. You amaze all of us. And believe me, if we had all of you in Congress, we wouldn't have any problems. Thank you for being here. Okay, let's get back on track. I got a little bit carried away. <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce to you someone I met several years ago when we were working on how to improve a program that is very dear to me, the KCBA Future of the Law Institute. At the time, he was president of the KCBA Foundation when our next presenter is not working on a project for KCBA or volunteering on his various committees, he is working hard at his day job as partner at Hillis, Clark, Martin, and Peterson. Please welcome the current president of the King County Bar Association, Mr. Steve Rovink. Thank you, Karen. What an amazing turnout, a 700-person sellout. Very nicely done. On behalf of KCBA's Board of Trustees, I would like to welcome all of you today. And yes, um, since about half of King County is probably going to have laryngitis on Monday after Sunday's game, I decided to get a little head start on it. I apologize for my gravelly voice. Um, but I just did not want to miss today's gathering. Each year, hundreds of KCBA members put their shoulder to the wheel in service to our profession and to our community. Our MLK Luncheon Committee leads the way in putting heart and soul into making this event so successful. And so while we've said it before, before we go on, let's just give one more round of applause for the excellent work of Judge Jones, Karen Murray, and the entire MLK committee in this event. As you can tell, this is one of the best attended events organized by KCBA. And I think that is so because it captures the passion and the dream of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the pursuit of freedom, equality, and justice across our country. From its founding nearly 130 years ago, those values have been central to the mission of the King County Bar Association as well. And while the troubling events of the past year demonstrate that there is much work to be done, it feels good today to pause, to honor our victories, and also to recognize the challenges that remain. In that regard, we look forward to hearing from our speaker today, Janae Nelson, about how some of those challenges are being addressed across the country. However, before Karen introduces our keynote speaker, let's take a moment to celebrate one of this bar's most successful diversity initiatives, our Minority Law Student Scholarship Program. Over the years, we have raised and distributed close to $2 million in scholarships to minority law students at Seattle University and the University of Washington. <laughs> to see that you get your money's worth, we've asked one of the past recipients of that scholarship and a great friend of KCBA to say a few words to you today. Judge Patrick Oishi was appointed to the King County Superior Court in 2011. Before taking the bench, he was a Pierce County Superior Court Commissioner. And before that, he practiced civil litigation, served as a deputy prosecuting attorney, and most admirably, was a high school teacher. Judge Oishi, Oishi earned his bachelor's degree in education from Seattle University 
and his JD from Seattle University School of Law. Please welcome the Honorable Patrick Oishi. Thank you, Steve. And good afternoon to everyone. I want to thank KCBA for inviting me here today to speak about the importance of the Barr Foundation Minority Law Student Scholarship Program. I believe very strongly in the importance of diversity in the, in the Bar and commend the ongoing efforts of the Bar Association and the Bar Foundation in supporting this ideal. During my journey as a child growing up in Hawaii, a school teacher in South King County, and as, as a trial attorney, I've always been immersed in the rich diversity of our communities. Now as a trial judge, I have a first-hand opportunity to, to interact with many diverse members of our community, including jurors, witnesses, and of course, litigants. We serve an incredibly diverse population in King County Superior Court. Our interpreter services uses interpreters speaking 150 different languages, of which the most prevalent are Spanish, Vietnamese, Somali, Mandarin, and Russian. Parties who come into contact with our legal system should feel welcome and fairly treated. They should not feel as if they are standing outside looking through a window, but rather they should feel they are looking into a mirror that reflects the rich diversity and cultures of our community. I've been blessed with many positive opportunities and people having faith in my abilities and potential to achieve. A significant award for me was receiving this scholarship, not just for the monetary assistance, but for what it represented. The Bar Association and Bar Foundation believed that I was worth investing in. As chair of the KCBA Diversity Committee, I have the opportunity to speak to many outstanding scholarship recipients, and I'm always impressed with these outstanding law students. They consistently express how thankful they are to have the opportunity to attend law school and to be selected as a scholarship recipient. These students are especially appreciative of the Bar Association and the Bar Foundation having faith in them and investing in their futures. The Bar Foundation Minority Student Scholarship Program provides great opportunities and much needed support to students from many different backgrounds. Greater diversity will strengthen our bar and bench and will enable us to provide the best service to the communities and people who truly rely on us. This scholarship program is an investment in the future of our legal profession. Thank you. I would just like to take this opportunity before I introduce our guest, and that is to say that there are envelopes in your program and I must say, it is so important to think about giving to this scholarship. Please give what you can. It can indeed make a difference. Thank you. Jeremy Pons, a national civil rights activist, made a statement reflecting on the legacy of Dr. King and what he represented beyond his I have a dream speech. He said, we want to freeze Dr. King as that man at the Lincoln Memorial, talking about a dream when he had a lot more depth to him than just that. Dr. King spoke about a variety of situations that we really see coming to pass now. He said that the three evils of society are racism, poverty, and violence. And we see all three of those evils still working and interrelated. He said as long as those three evils exist, we still need organizations like the SCLC and people of all walks of life to come together and try to eradicate them. 
That's my mission. Without a doubt, King's words could easily apply to the organization that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund Incorporated. LDF is the premier nonprofit civil rights organization founded in 1940 by the late and first black U.S. Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. Its mission then and now is fighting for racial and social justice where, ir where injustices exist. While primarily focusing on the civil rights of African Americans in the United States, LDF has been involved in the campaign for human rights throughout the world, including in South Africa, Canada, Brazil, and elsewhere. Most recently, the organization has been very involved in matters in their own backyard. The current 20 plus attorneys who have joined the ranks of their predecessors are brilliant, dedicated, and passionate individuals. They are vigilant, maybe even sometimes defiant, as they continue to find ways to litigate ongoing challenges to affirmative action in higher education, key provisions of the Voting Rights Act, and policies of police departments where the issue of probable cause and using excessive or deadly force is justifiable just because. LDF continues to widen its legal net to challenge the status quo of injustice that clearly still exists in the criminal justice system our educational institutions, housing, health care, and the environment. So we are very fortunate to have with us today Ms. Janae Nelson, who stepped into her new role full-time as Associate Director Counsel at LDF on August 13, 2014. Like her boss, Sherilyn Eiffel, and others who have become a member of this elite organization. She too rejoined the LDF family after serving as the director of the political participation group and as an NAACP LDF Fried Frank Fellow, where she oversaw all voting related litigation, litigation of voting rights in redistricting cases and worked on criminal issues on behalf of the African Americans in other underserved communities. Ms. Nelson also journeyed into the academic world for eight years at St. John's University School of Law. Because of her distinguished career as an educator and her noted academic scholarship, she has been the recipient of many awards, including the Derrick A. Bell Award from the American Association of Law School Sections on Minority Groups and was also named one of Lawyers of Color's 50 under 50 minority professors making an impact in legal education. How lucky those students are to have had her. When Ms. Nelson is not researching a legal issue or litigating a case, she is often called upon to appear on CNN, Inside Out, public radio, and other media as an election law expert. But no matter the task she takes on, she is always willing and prepared to step in to make a positive and crucial contribution. After reading and researching both Ms. Eiffel and Ms. Nelson, I believe without a doubt that under their leadership, LDF can be a pivotal player in, an, in eradicating the three evils that King spoke of, racism, poverty, and violence. In fact, in the words of our guest speaker, she addressed Dr. King's concerns in her own way when commenting on her return to LDF. She said, it is truly a privilege to return to LDF, 
to build on its legacy of excellence and help to advance its critical mission of racial justice, equality, and human rights. For nearly 75 years, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund has been at the heart of the struggle to transform society and reinforce our democratic ideas. I look forward to working hand in hand with LDF's talented attorneys, dedicated staff, and valued partners that to continue that journey of progress. It is with sincerest gratitude that I introduce to you Ms. Janae Nelson. Thank you for that introduction. That was so rousing. Um, it, it, it nearly rivaled the beautiful singing we heard up here just a moment ago. Well, good afternoon. It is truly an honor to be here in King County celebrating one of our greatest human rights icons, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. As you heard, my name is Janae Nelson. I am not Charlotte Eiffel. I am proudly uh, the Associate Director Counsel of the Legal Defense Fund, and I bring our President and Director Counsel's warmest greetings and regrets from the East Coast. Uh, I have the privilege of serving alongside our visionary leader in advancing the mission of social justice and racial justice that Karen just described. And LDF thanks you very much for this invitation. I'm especially grateful to the King County Bar Association, Martin Luther King Jr. Committee, not only for this, this truly lovely event, but for its graciousness and its hospitality. Uh, you've all been so welcoming and I, I greatly appreciate that. I also wanna personally thank the Honorable Richard Jones for initially extending the invitation to LDF uh, to Denise Medlock and of course, Karen Murray. They've been such thoughtful shepherds of this program. I also thank the University of Washington School of Law. I met with some of their students earlier this morning, and as I told them, it is refreshing for me to meet with the next generation of change agents. Uh, it makes me know that this work that we do is not in vain, that there is another line of reinforcement coming behind us. I also extend my thanks to the law firm of Perkins Coie and the many, many hands that are responsible for this special occasion. I should say that LDF uh, has a special kinship with the Evergreen State. In addition to our many friends and supporters in Washington, including our board member, George Wallerstein and his lovely wife, uh, Ms. Lutz, uh, and our cooperating attorneys like Eric Schnapper, uh, who was a former LDF lawyer and a dear friend of the organization. LDF has uh, participated in several key cases here in Washington. We were amici in Parents Involved versus Seattle School District, which as you know was a constitutional challenge to the school district's voluntary integration efforts. Both the district court and the Ninth Circuit agree that Seattle could use race uh, use it as a tiebreaker when the demand for seats in schools that were oversubscribed and were racially imbalanced um, were high. Unfortunately, of course, a majority of the Supreme Court, led by our Chief Justice, struck down that program as unconstitutional. LDF also litigated a case in which I was personally involved at the outset, uh, one called Farrakhan versus Washington which became Farrakhan versus Gregoire. Yes, we can applaud that case. <laughs> um, it wasn't a victory, but it was a challenge, and it started off as a very promising challenge to the felon disenfranchisement laws of Washington State under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. These laws deny the right to vote to persons with felony convictions, and the district court, importantly, found compelling evidence of racial discrimination in the state's 
criminal justice system against African Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans, but it didn't find a voting rights violation. And after a favorable panel decision and a remand and then a rehearing on Bonk, we were ultimately defeated. Uh, I said we participated in cases. I didn't say we, we won those cases here in, in uh, Washington State. Um, but I say this because we've taken some lumps together, right? LDF and the good people of Washington State. So I hope then that I can speak freely here today. You may have noticed that we are surrounded by milestones. We are awash with celebrations and commemorations of some of the most important moments of the transformative era in our history, the Civil Rights Movement. Last year, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 turned 50. The historic Brown versus Board of Education case turned 60. This year, 2015, we commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March and its tragic precursor, Bloody Sunday, and also the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And if I may immodestly add to that list, there's another milestone in which I take particular pride, and that is the 75th anniversary of LDF's founding. In 1940, as you heard, Thurgood Marshall led the creation of LDF. And along the way, he was joined by legal luminaries like Charles Hamilton Houston, Jack Greenberg, Spotswood Robinson, Connie Marshall, Robert Carter, and the list goes on. 17 years after the Legal Defense Fund was formed, we became fully independent of the NAACP. Uh, and although we share some of uh, uh, all of the NAACP's goals, uh, we are our own organization with a separate board, fully independent, and we've remained at the center of the struggle for uh, justice and equality throughout our 75 years. Each of these civil rights milestones, and there are certainly others, but each of these milestones is especially monumental when you think of the context out of which they emerged and what they accomplished for our nation. Brown, for example, didn't simply underturn, overturn Plessy's separate but equal doctrine in public education facilities. It introduced an entirely new theory of equality under the Constitution. And out of that new theory of substantive equality that Brown ushered in, emerged this unprecedented multiracial, integrated, democratic experiment that we call modern America. Brown also brought before the American public arguments that were rarely made in integrated settings. In his closing argument in the last Brown hearing, Thurgood Marshall told the court that the doctrine of separate but equal was rooted in the desire to keep, and I quote, the people who were formerly in slavery as near to that stage as is possible. Who had ever said that to nine justices of the Supreme Court? Brown was a vehicle for examining what it means to be a citizen in this country, for what the equal citizenship of black people, which had been denied for more than 70 years following Reconstruction, really meant. Brown also presented an opportunity to confront the deep-seated psychological damage of racism on individuals and on American society as a whole. It gave us a lens to look at racism not only as a system of subjugation of blacks and other people of color, but also as a dehumanizing cancer that festered in the perpetrators and perpetuators of racism. Of course, Brown was not an unalloyed success, with all delivered speed turned into all delivered slack and, more often than not, deliberate assault and resistance. But while we find ourselves still living in a country where roughly less than a quarter of black students attended majority white institutions, 
which is nearly half the rate uh, or half the percentage of the peak integration rates in 1988 when 43% of black students attended majority white institutions. It's undeniable that Brown immeasurably transformed not just classrooms, but boardrooms and courtrooms and the Oval Office. But as those statistics reveal, our work remains. There are still over 200 cases that are being overseen by the Department of Justice and LDF, uh, desegregating cases. Uh, schools throughout the South. And in the same way that Brown transformed our understanding of citizenship and personhood, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 crystallized the ideals of our democracy. I hope everyone in this room has had a chance to see the movie Selma. Okay, clearly, clearly not everyone. If not, I think there's a matinee showing it right after this lunch that, that you can catch. Um, despite what the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences believes, Selma is, it's the movie of the year. Selma is an, out, an outstanding film. But as searing, creative, and beautifully depicted as the film is, it still does not fully capture, as no two-hour film could, the raw human sacrifice strength, determination, strategy, intellect that led to the passage of the crown jewel legislation of the civil rights movement. When Congress first passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, there were only five black elected officials in Congress, less than 1,400 black elected officials nationwide. By the end of the 1970s, the total number of black elected officials nationwide had more than doubled to nearly 5,000. And by the 1990s, black elected officials were experiencing record successes throughout the country, country ending the decade at nearly 10,000 in number. There are now more than 10,000 black elected officials across the nation. The Voting Rights Act not only changed the complexion of the electorate, but as you can see, it critically transformed the halls of power. And Congress has amended the Voting Rights Act numerous times over decades with overwhelming support, each time improving it to account for the complexity of discriminatory tactics in voting. The VRA now not only protects against intentional discrimination, but also against voting laws that result in the denial and curtailment of the right to vote on account of race. It also includes in critical provisions to protect Latinos and Asians and other language minorities, which is an important detail given the increasing diversity of our electorate. However, as you may have heard, the Voting Rights Act is now a shadow of its former self. In a 2013 case called Shelby County versus Holder, the Supreme Court struck down Section 4B of the Act, disabling the strongest safety check against racial discrimination in voting. Section 4B interacted with another section of the Act, Section 5, and it required certain states and smaller jurisdictions with a history of virulent race discrimination in voting to seek preclearance from the federal government before it could enact new voting laws. Within hours of Section 5's incapacitation by the court, the state of Texas threatened to restore a photo ID law that the federal government had already found to be racially discriminatory. LDF challenged that photo ID law and post-Shelby was victorious under a separate section of the act, Section 2, just before the midterm elections. In an opinion written by Judge Nelva Gonzalez Ramos, she held that the state of Texas intentionally enacted stringent photo ID laws to discriminate against black and Latino voters, and that that law was the equivalent of a poll tax. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court allowed the past midterm elections 
to be governed under that law, that law that a federal district court held to be discriminatory because Texas was in the process of appealing that opinion. We are still fighting that battle in Texas. And Texas's photo ID law is just one in a series of restrictive and discriminatory voting laws that were unleashed across the country after the Shelby decision. Whether you consider the voucher tests in Alabama that require voters to be verified by two poll workers in order for them to vote without an ID, or if you think about the cuts in early voting in Florida and North Carolina where African Americans rely on early voting more than any other group, or the stringent photo ID laws that I just described, there is a resurgence of voter suppression in the wake of Shelby County that is undeniable. We need to restore the Voting Rights Act to its full powers. <laughs> One common thread linking Brown and the passage of the VRA and most historic civil rights, racial justice milestones is the catalyzing force of change that African American people and their allies and leaders have had on this nation. From Frederick Douglass and the 13th Amendment, which has its sesquicentennial this year at 150 years old, um, to King and the women and men of Selma that led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act, the struggle against racism in this country has brought our nation closer to fulfilling the true promise of its principles. And King often spoke and wrote about this. He wrote about the immense contribution that the civil rights struggle made to American society and the world. In one of his most compelling manuscripts, my, my favorite, Why We Can't Wait, King chronicles the year of 1963 in Birmingham. He compares the worlds of two youngsters, one in Alabama, one in New York, and talks about the commonalities they face in an unequal and unjust world. He describes Birmingham and the white hot tensions that existed in 1963 when the movement was at a seeming tipping point of either progress or implosion. He sanguinely predicted, eventually the civil rights movement will have contributed infinitely more to the nation than the eradication of racial justice, injustice. It will have enlarged the concept of brotherhood to a vision of total relatedness. We're not there yet, but we are on our way. Of course, African American agency did not operate in a vacuum. It was informed and inspired by international struggles and enabled by a multiracial, multi-ethnic coalition of supporters. And without those cooperative and collaborative efforts, the movement would have been hobbled and eventually hollow. But at the same time that we bask in the glory of these historic accomplishments and unparalleled milestones, we are, as we've heard today, in a country in the midst of turmoil and angst. The battle for equality and human dignity is being waged with a fury unlike we've seen in recent past. It wages on the streets of Ferguson, where LDF has extended untold resources, unpacking the confluence of socioeconomic and political conditions that have resulted in a municipality where elected officials are unresponsive to black voices, police culture is one of disregard and disrespect, and a municipal fining and debt structure exists that has created a vicious cycle in which its black citizens finance the government systems that target and oppress them through fines and traffic stops and other incidences. Solving these sorts of systemic barriers to equality 
forces us to deconstruct what local government should look like, what purpose it should serve, who can hold it accountable, and how. The genesis of some of these problems we see in Ferguson is not unlike the suburbanization of poverty that the King County Bar Association identified in its annual report on equality and social justice. As many have said, Ferguson is everywhere. And we have many materials on our website. We've created a page just for this event that houses a number of documents that we've created that speak to this issue, including one that's called the Focus on Ferguson, and another that is our recent letter calling for an investigation of the grand jury proceedings uh, uh, surrounding the Michael Brown killing. Indeed, the battle wages on in New York, where we've joined the state attorney general's call for the appointment of a special prosecutor in all cases where there's a suspicion of violent police con misconduct, where our broken windows, policing practices have black and Latino communities under siege. In fact, we just settled a case with the New York City Police Department and their practices in New York City housing projects where they unlawfully and discriminatorily enforced trespass laws, uh, routinely subjecting residents to stops and searches without any reasonable suspicion or any probable cause of illegal conduct. The battle wages on right here in Seattle, at Westlake Mall, where a black assault vis victim was pepper sprayed as the white assailant walked away, or where a young woman was nearly blinded in one eye by an officer while handcuffed. Indeed, the battle for police reform, the nonviolent direct action of die-ins, of protests, of phone banks and Twitter thunderclaps wages on across America because a new generation of activists is unrelenting and undeterred. And as an institution that has fought for fairness in the criminal justice system since its inception, in addition to the work we do on the ground, we have called for broad federal intervention in response to police violence. As a preliminary matter, we've asked the Department of Justice to undertake a comprehensive review of police-involved assaults and killings to begin to collect data so that we can fully understand the scope of this problem and track it and monitor it. We also want the Department of Justice to hold officers and police departments accountable to the fullest extent of the law. We've asked the Department of Justice to incentivize training on racial bias and excessive force through the power of the purse, through the funding that they provide to uh, enforce Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which prevents government agencies from funding if they are, it, when from funding entities if they are engaged in racial discrimination. Finally, we've also called for uh, the controversial measure of police worn cameras to hold officers accountable to ensure that we have evidence of violations. This of course is not a panacea and it requires a great deal of study and care, uh, but it certainly is a step in the right direction in changing our expectations of law enforcement and of the federal government's oversight of law enforcement. So yes, the battle wages on despite the astounding gains of the civil rights movement that set unprecedented advancement in motion, but did not move the dial all the way to equilibrium. And these battles can seem daunting. I was talking with the students at the University of Washington School of Law uh, just a few, few hours ago, and we were talking about how you maintain your faith how you maintain your vision for justice when the odds seem so stacked against you. And this is particularly difficult for organizations like ours who are in the business of civil rights work, in the business of what we call democracy maintenance, where we see ourselves as taking part of the shared responsibility 
of nursing this nascent multiracial democracy to its feet. And I believe we find ourselves at a particularly critical crossroads. We can either embrace and lean into this tumult with our sleeves rolled up in the unwavering expectation that we will come out stronger on the other side, or we can keep our fists clenched, heads down, eyes averted, and kick the can down the road. If we choose this latter course, not only do we risk explosion, worse, we miss an opportunity for our own milestone. In fact, this is what the world looks like before a milestone. That's what makes a milestone by definition. That's what makes it remarkable. It's a turning point, a watershed moment, a significant change in the stage of development. It is a moment that defies convention and inertia. Somehow, visionaries like King could see past the chaos of the present to the promise of future change. King could see quite literally the days to come, which is the title of one of my favorite chapters in Why We Can't Wait. King called out the urgency of the moment. What these people do not realize is that gradualism and moderation are not the answer to the great moral indictment. He also cautioned that as certain as it is that planned gradualism will not work, neither will unplanned spontaneity. Those are the words of a strategist. He gets it. So what is our way forward? What are our days to come if they are not to be weighted with gradualism or spoiled by unplanned spontaneity? Well, of course, the times we're in are very different from 1963, and, and much progress has been made in a great many spheres. But there is still an urgency in this present moment that can't be ignored. We are witnessing the growing empowerment and activism of our youth, strengthened multiracial alliances, new and different points of interest convergence that we can leverage. And King did nothing if not remind us of the transformative power of protest when people stand up for change and the power of an active and inclusive democracy when all voices are heard. So I will close with this nagging question. What is our racial justice milestone? Not individually, but as a generation, as this random grouping of 700 people uh, traveling this earth together at this particular moment, what is our racial justice milestone? Will it be the passing of the Voting Rights Amendment Act, not only to restore protections that the Supreme Court excised in Shelby County in 2013, but to cement the future of our democracy with even greater protections against discrimination in voting and more ways to expand our electorate like restoring the right to vote to persons with felony convictions. Because we know, we know it reduces recidivism. We know that all voices must be heard if government is to be truly accountable to its people. Like automatic voter registration for every eligible citizen. There will, of course, be opposition. Just this past Wednesday, Bob Goodlatte, the House Judiciary Committee Chair, said that there is no need to fix the Voting Rights Act. Even though the photo ID law in the state of Virginia that he represents, which was formerly covered by Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, I must add, threatens to disqualify nearly 200,000 people from voting. This includes a 93-year-old cancer patient who was unable to vote for the first time in 72 years because she lacked photo identification. This is the uphill battle we face. But there is a lot of support for amending the act and for broader reforms. Pub the public and elected officials now see that the federal government's 
inability to pre-approve new voting laws has forced the Justice Department to rely on other provisions of the Voting Rights Act that, while important, are no replacement for the uniquely preemptive measure that the court struck down in Shelby County. Will our milestone be a reinvention of the institution of law enforcement to transform police officers into true peace officers using some of the reforms I mentioned a moment ago as a start? Will it be protecting disparate impact under the Fair Housing Act? The Supreme Court will hear oral argument in a case this coming Wednesday, Texas versus the Inclusive Communities Project. And in this case, in the crux of it, is the disparate impact standard that received such broad bipartisan support in its enactment. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Fair Housing Act was passed two weeks after King's assassination as an honor to his legacy. And since then, it has been instrumental in eliminating policies like racially exclusive zoning rules, subsidies for segregated communities and redlining, policies that perpetuate racial segregation and limit opportunity. The vestiges of these policies continue to drive residential patterns throughout the country, including in places like Ferguson. Or will our racial justice milestone be finally to realize the full promise of Brown? <laughs> finally. To recognize equal educational opportunity as a universal good in the face of incessant and unyielding challenges to affirmative action and the diversity rationale that supports those programs, in the face of segregation within school systems and within schools, and in the face of a widening school to prison pipeline that pulls students of color out of classrooms and into the criminal justice system for minor disciplinary infractions. There is an undeniable urgency to all of these issues, and there are many more. At LDF, we are always working toward new milestones just for these reasons. And while we don't know precisely what the next milestone will be, we remain engaged in a full frontal attack to secure equity in education, to fight for economic justice and empowerment, to protect our voting rights, to ensure fairness in the criminal justice system. And we are confident that the load-bearing walls at which we steadfastly chisel and surgically attack with every legal tool in our arsenal will one day come crumbling down. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Please remember the name Janae Nelson because, trust me, this will not be the last time that you hear about her or see her. She is an incredible woman, and thank you for giving an incredible presentation. So before we close, I throw the challenge I throw out every single year that we celebrate Dr. King's birthday, and that is, what do we do now? What do we do with all this energy that we have in this room? Well, the first thing I'm gonna do is ask you to do something that's gonna make every managing partner in this room upset with me and go insanely and crazy. I'm gonna ask you to go back to work and for the first several minutes, not build time, but to go and follow what Ms. Nelson asked you to do today. And that was to go to their website and see the fine work that they are doing. And the brief education that you get for the time that you spend, share that education, share that website, 
and share with your children and other people that you know the fine work that's being done in this country. Can you imagine the enthusiasm to civil rights that we would have if we could get everybody as inspired as we are about Russell Wilson doing something on Sunday? <laughs> we would eradicate every single issue on the planet associated with voting rights. Carry that. So please carry that same dedication as you go forward. And Ms. Nelson, I'll apologize for our group because when you saw the paltry number of people that applauded for having seen Selma, please understand we don't get everything that you all get back in Washington, D.C. <laughs> as quickly. I had a chance to see a different showing, and trust me, by Monday, everybody in this room will have a chance to see many of the speakers we've had from this lectern speak to you come to life. You'll also have a chance to see Dr. King come to life. And after watching that movie, I can tell you, I walked away with tears in my eyes more than a few times. And I asked myself the single question, I think all of you will have as well. Would I have had the same individual courage that Dr. King and the people of the civil rights movement in that era to be able to perform and take the punishment and abuse that they did so that we can have that mosaic and rainbow of children today? Because to me, that represents Dr. King's dream being fulfilled. So thank you for being here today, and we'll see you next year.